Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study in the Red Letter series, and today we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 16. Now, Jesus has just been transfigured on the mount, and it says, when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. So this man recognizes the lordship of Jesus of Nazareth, he bows before him in an act of submission and surrender, and he says, have mercy upon my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. You know, Jesus says those same words to us, friends. O oh, faithless and perverse generation, you who have been given all the mysteries of the kingdom, you who have been given my spirit to walk in power and victory and yet you continue to walk in the ways of this world. You are faithless and perverse. I am faithless and perverse. And God forgive me for being so, friend. But that's what he says unto us. Faithless and perverse generation. You who continue to walk with the mindset of this world. Who refuse to take the mindset of the kingdom. How long will I suffer you? Bring him hither to me, Jesus says unto the man. And so Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour. Do you recall Jesus saying, greater things than I have done, you will do? But you must understand in order to do those things, there is a process. There is a secret. There is a spiritual law that you must follow. And so Jesus is going to touch on this, but he's not going to explain it. And so I want us to look a little bit closer at what Jesus is saying, and maybe we can discover the truth, the secret. It goes on in verse 19, it says, so the disciples came to Jesus later by themselves apart, and they said, why could we not cast out that demon? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Now remember that word, unbelief, because that's going to be the key element we're going to focus in on. He says, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, which is one of the tiniest seeds man knows, friends, if we just have that small amount of faith, you could say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it would remove, and nothing will be impossible to you. You could cast out demons. You could cure and heal the sick. You could raise the dead. You could perform miracles that would seem impossible to the common man. But how are you to do this? Only through prayer and fasting. Now let's stop right there and let's just take a moment and consider this. When we think of prayer, we truly don't know what prayer is. Because if you'll recall, and if you're familiar with the Gospels, when everyone else was asleep, Jesus was out on a hillside praying, fellowshipping with the Father, communing with the Father, talking to the Father. Do you remember when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead? And just as he is about to bring Lazarus forth, he basically says, Father, you and I have already talked about this situation, and I know that Lazarus is coming out of that grave because you have told me so. But for the benefit of those standing here, Lazarus, come forth. And Jesus is giving us a behind-the-scenes view of what takes place in prayer. 
You see, we hear from the Father what he is already accomplishing, and we become one with the Father. The Father doesn't adjust himself or his will to our desires and our needs, but we adjust our will, our desire, our needs to the Father and what the Father is already doing, how he is already working. You see, Jesus could have rose that morning and he could have went the opposite direction and he could have been busy about the Father's work. He could have continued to preach and to teach and to heal and to cure and to raise the dead in another place. But the Father had told him, no, I want you to wait upon me Mary and Martha are going to come to you and they're going to give you this news that Lazarus has died and I want you to go and I want you to bring Lazarus from the dead out of the grave. And that applies to our lives too because we can be busy working for the Lord but not fully be in the will of the Lord. So often we are busy with our own works and we're not actively involved in the Father's works. Friends, there is a great lesson for us to learn here. But even more than that, to our text, Jesus says the only way that you will exercise this faith is in prayer. You must go in and join the Father where he's at, become aware of what the Father is doing, and then act upon it. And if the Father doesn't reveal anything to you, then you should remain still and you should remain quiet. Wait upon God, and he will provide direction for you. And until you receive that direction, do not move. So Jesus says, first of all, if you want to operate with this spiritual power, you have to do it through a life of prayer. And this is going to bring great sacrifice on your part. Now, friends, let me pause right here and say that the message of the Bible is for all. And so even those who teach it may not be practicing it to the same degree that the Bible is communicating it. And I simply say that to say, look, I have not raised the dead. I have not spoke to this mountain and it moved. I have not healed anyone miraculously. And so I'm just as in need for this lesson as you are. But these are the words of Jesus and this is what he is saying unto his disciples then and unto his disciples and his followers. Now, if you want to operate in such fashion, you have to be committed to a life of prayer. And not prayer as you understand it, not prayer as you have been taught it, not prayer as you have heard it. Very few know how to tap into the heart of God and really move in a lifestyle of prayer, friends. But this is what Jesus is praying. If you want to do these things, you have to learn to pray as I pray. And so you have to be committed to a life of prayer, a life of sacrifice. And with that same idea, a life of fasting. Now, why does he mention fasting out of all the other spiritual disciplines? He doesn't say that you have to know the word. He doesn't say that you have to study the word. He doesn't say that you have to be actively involved in the city that you live in, ministering the gospel, teaching others, discipling others. He doesn't say that you have to be a pastor of a church or preaching on a corner. He says you have to be giving yourself to a life of fasting. Why? Because again, this is about sacrifice. Now, let me explain for a moment so that you may better understand. I want you to, in your mind, visualize that I have a glass. And in this glass, it is three quarter full of, let's just say Coca-Cola. Now, if I wanted to pour something into this glass, it will only contain one quarter more before it begins to overflow. And that's us, friends. You see, as we live life upon this earth, we are filling our spiritual glass with so many things. So many of the choices that we make, these could be choices of lifestyle. The things that we watch, the things that we listen to, the clothing that we wear, the material possessions that we buy. And so these things pile up in this glass. And God says, okay, I want to pour spiritual insight, spiritual blessing into your life. 
I want to open your eyes. I want to bring the scales down so that you begin to see the spiritual realm. That you begin to walk in spiritual power. And for us, that is very uncomfortable because we are fish in water. And what God says is if you want to walk in the kingdom, in the spiritual life, you have to leave what is natural to you, what is comfortable to you, as a fish would exit the water, and you have to walk around on dry land. So you have to leave the physical, and you have to walk in the spiritual. Now, at first, when you take a fish out of the water, he's going to flop all over the ground because he's out of his natural environment It's so uncomfortable experience for him, and he's doing everything he can to get back in the water. And that's what you and I do. The first time God begins to give a spiritual revelation, it's like, whoa, that's too much. I can't can't understand that. I can't deal with that. I can't experience that. I'm going to go back to what I know. I'm going to go back to the water. But Jesus says we must be people of the kingdom. We must be people of the spirit. And so... Imagining that glass again, what our duty is, is as his followers, is to begin to empty that glass. We begin to take things away from our lives, the things we enjoy, the, how we entertain ourselves, the things that we buy, the things that we look at, the things that we watch, the things that bring us pleasure. All of these things have to be removed from this glass. And as we begin to remove them from the glass, the glass becomes emptier and e- emptier, which means it, it, it leaves more room for more spiritual revelation, more spiritual truth, more spiritual insight. The reason so many who call themselves followers of Jesus continually perpetuate the same things that they have heard throughout their lives and they don't walk with any fresh new spiritual revelation is because their glass is half full, three quarter full, seven eighths full. And so they only have so much room that God can give them spiritual truth and spiritual insight. But the emptier that that glass becomes, the more God can pour in. And our duty is to empty the glass, to become empty. This is what Jesus meant when he said, the more you give, the more you will receive. Certainly this applies in the material world, the physical world that we live in, but even more so it applies in the spiritual world. You see, God isn't required to bestow upon us physical blessings. Let me say that again. God is not required, nor does he promise anywhere in scripture to bestow upon us physical blessings, but he is required by his own law and his own promises to bestow upon us spiritual blessings if we will simply ask. And that's what Jesus means when he says, look, ask whatever you will in my name, according to my will, and I will give it to you. But he's not talking about the numbers on a lottery ticket. He's not talking about a new house. He's not talking about a better job. Does he sometimes bless us with those things? Yes, and he's to be praised for doing so. But he's not required to do so. And so back to our text and our lesson, what we have to understand is the more that we give, the more that we'll receive. And this is a spiritual law that works just as as much as a physical law does. As I have told you in the past, if you don't believe in gravity, that's a physical law. You may not believe in it, but it doesn't mean that the law doesn't apply. Climb up on your house, jump off and watch it apply. When you hit the ground, you will believe in the physical law of gravity. And it's the same way with the spiritual law. Begin to rid your life of the things that you enjoy, the things that you take pleasure in. That's why it's called a sacrifice. People so often say to me, Pastor, you harp on music and you harp on TV and you harp on sports. Why? Is it something necessarily wrong with those things? Well, yes, but you can get into heaven doing those things possibly, but you're missing out on walking in spiritual power in this life because the more you sacrifice, the more he sacrifices. Do you understand? That's what John the Baptist meant when he said, less of me and more of him. 
It's a very simple process. It's very simple to understand. It's very difficult to practice because we don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to give up these things. And so Jesus says, what is the greatest thing you could sacrifice? You could go without football. You could go without NASCAR. You could go without baseball and you would continue to live and breathe. You can go without rock and roll. You can go without country. You can go without rap or jazz and you would still continue to live and breathe. You could go without certain types of clothing and jewelry and other material possessions and you would still live and breathe. But you cannot go without food and still live and breathe. So the greatest sacrifice outside of giving up your very own life would be the sacrifice of food. And Jesus says, if you want to walk in this spiritual power, the only way you're going to do so is be committed to a life of sacrificial, heart-touching, God-moving prayer, and you're going to have to dedicate yourself to a life of giving up food And the more you do that, the longer you do that, the more you begin to walk in spiritual power. Because as you kill, sacrifice the flesh, the spirit becomes empowered. As you cater to the flesh, the spirit becomes weakened. And the reason that so many people walk in such defeat and are so weak in their spiritual lives is because all they're doing is catering to the flesh. So if you want, as the disciples wanted, to perform the things that Jesus performed, if I want to do that, this is the secret, friends. Less of me, more of him. And we see this through less of me, more of prayer, less of me, more of fasting. That's what Jesus says. Look at it again. Verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus and said, why couldn't we cast these demons out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Unbelief is tied to a lack of prayer and a lack of fasting. Belief is tied to a life of prayer and a life of fasting. Why? Because the topic here is because of your unbelief, you couldn't do these things. But if you will pray and fast according to the way God desires you to do so, your unbelief will turn to belief. And then you will have the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, and you could say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it would do so. Nothing will be impossible to you. However, it only is so by prayer and fasting. Now, as I said, friends, the word of God is preaching as much to me today as it is to you. Should I fast? Absolutely. Could I fast more? Absolutely. Should I pray? Absolutely. Could I pray more? Absolutely. So I need to step up and be the man of God that he's called me to be through this text just as much as you feel like right now you need to do so. The question is, are we going to obey or is this lesson going to go in one side of our ears and out the other? The principle is true. The promise is sure. The obedience, that's questionable. Well, I pray, friends, that you will obey what the Lord Jesus is trying to reveal to us today, his truth, and that as John the Baptist once again said, less of us, more of him. Now, as Yahweh wills, and until the next video, friends, walk faithfully before your Lord, your Master, and your King, and in all things, let his praises be upon your lips. Now, until the next video, friends, I love you. Have a blessed day in Jesus, and I'll see you on the next video.